And as we transit, we are actually going to talk about uh, human dreams um, uh, that are, are, uh, can, can drive us forward. And how can we discover dreams that connect us? And maybe to start it, we have um, four uh, really interesting panelists. But uh, one way of seeing our forum today and the next days is that this is a space where we co-create so um, people in the forefront, people that are panelists, are the ones to catalyze this conversation, to open it up. But it's, we are all here present and sharing and uh, weaving with each other, whatever we have to, to share. And um, so the space is opened. As, uh, and one of the ways to contribute uh, for you is to actually share your thoughts in the chat all along use the chat as a parallel channel of communication. And uh, also we'll, we'll share the tags so we can involve more people online through Twitter, um, sorry, it's called X now, uh, Facebook and other uh, platforms, um, kind of pulling them also into our conversation. Um, dream time. And we have today uh, two people that are exploring this uh, concept very deeply but exploring it also in practice. We have uh, Jack uh, Manning Bancroft and we have Parul uh, that are founders and uh, co-creators among with many other people of um, um, the network of mentorship that comes, that sort of supports the, the Aboriginal youth. And Jack, um, I know that you are uh, the um, you bear, let's say, two two heritages. Uh, one of them is your Aboriginal heritage, uh, and uh, you are connected to this. Uh, we can say dream space um, and or dream time energy. Um, and uh, perhaps you can share more because I'm again I'm an ex someone who is external, but I know that uh, the way Aboriginal people see uh the land and the cosmos it's all born from the dream time of ancestors at first dreaming our our world into being and then it reveals itself um and i know that you are actually uh, creating that space of opportunity of dreaming and imagining for, for especially for young people and you are the founder of a new type of nation which is called imagination <laughs> Uh, where um, uh, in, in people that are capable of imagining are, are bringing dreams together. Um, so just to name other people and then over to you, Jack, uh, we also have Francois Tadej, who is the founder of Learning Planet Institute and another big dreamer, Kriton Arsenis, who I would say is one of key voices right now in uh, Europe for in the political space of uh, advocating for our connection with nature. And Kritan, I know you, you are driven by big dreams and aspirations. And we have uh, Anna Lucia Galvez, who is a dreamer, but also a practitioner, making a lot of change maker work in uh, Latin America, and particularly in Mexico, Guatemala, and other locations in Colombia. So I know you are also dreaming and making dreams real in connection with the earth. So um, we can start and we will involve other people and Jack, over to you, what do you think? What do you think is the role of human capability of dreaming? First of all, is it unique or do we share it with other species in this level? And what 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 do you kind of drive, derive from it? Or also maybe from your ancestorship? That's there, yeah, that's an easy question to answer at 12 30 in the morning. Um <laughs> we yeah, we we so a little bit of context reasonably quickly. Um, so my family's part of the Bunjalung Nation, which we're actually on that country right now, um, which is part of 200 nations around the the, the country that we have in Australia. Um, look, I I think to, to kind of try and condense a lot of the thinking into a very, very short frame, um, we've been working, you know, I've been involved with working on trying to alleviate inequity for 20 years started in one nation and realized oh it's not actually that we started working with kids this isn't about kids um after 12 years this is about our behavior as a species with all the other species so in the last eight or ten years we've been working on building that network globally which we're in the process now of, of culminating that with releasing 
um, the first network state into the internet in five days time called Imagination, which isn't for the kids. It's for organisations to become joy corporations. It's for the unearthing of a thousand Indigenous knowledge systems labs to move into the Bain and Company and McKinsey playgrounds to get to the front of the design queue and start to actually get Indigenous systems thinking to the start and to the finish. It's to get us repatterned centrally into our custodial ways and then to move as a relational economy in parallel to these transactional economies we've inherited. So there's a couple of really, really macro things I think are critical. Um, the first one is we've got to move away from this idea of the mystic. So it's not exactly correct. It's a it's a very nice um, thread to, to draw, but the concept that, that we have these, like in Australia, for example, the dream time, it's it's just a much more complicated nuanced set of stories um realities myths uh true song lines that all exist in a, in a variety of different pathways and what what it basically echoes down to is that we just the way our systems work back here for it's the oldest lab in human history. So we have 70,000 plus years of life and MIT Media Labs is the same age as me. So we can see where we've started to get some of the design direction wrong because I should not be getting all the questions. Um, the, the lab, the longest lab we've got here, it just designed our intelligence to nature and back from nature. It's a really, really simple thing. And if what we have got to as a species is we're unbelievably distracted, we're unbelievably focused in on the transaction, and in our distraction and our obsession with a transaction, we've lost our relation. We're not in relation beyond our nation states, which were drawn um, beyond our skin color, which is zeroed in on by these modern social networks, which just are advertising platforms, making us feel uncomfortable about ourselves and then addicted. And then we've lost our ability to be able to actually understand that we don't old, we don't own knowledge and knowledge isn't ours. So we're not heroes. Knowledge is, gifted to us in a long song and it's for us to pass back to nature and when we lose that connection we lose it all so all the titles all the bios all that stuff is bullshit we've, we've lost our way in knowledge knowledge is to be intentionally passed on and passed on really really focused now for this group and for groups of people that want to lead we've we've got to understand like how advanced um how 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 obvious that is you know that's that's the part and if that if our battle is to convince people that we should be in relationship to nature then as a species if we're just going to keep staring at the screens game over we've got to shift the networks with engineering and design and economics and if it doesn't move if we can't move the money if we can't move our attention then it's not going to move so i think fundamentally when we're in relation you don't want anything else and that's by design so that's why we have all of these other things that distract us and okay cool you've had a couple hundred years and, and sold a bunch of things and and now it's a critical time for us to, to shift those designs so i think there's an appetite there's a moment and 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 the way you know we've thought about our systems and thought about designing imagination has been collectively we've had people from 52 countries riding this country over two to three years we've got 14 people from 14 countries moving as a troop up and down these old song lines in Australia right now. And we've been telling big, big immersive stories, which we did with Francois in Paris. And we've been lighting up story together. And I think the way we can find um, our organisation into the humanity um, is it's about making sense and making meaning together and dropping the, the hero moment going, yeah, actually, I don't know. Um, you know, we've got a pretty good take on, on what we know now. We'd love to work collectively, diagonally, and keep cross-hatching powerfully and quickly. And if we do that in the mycelium way, game on. If we want to fuse a network of networks like as a species, that's where the internet is 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 our best, best, best tool. And if we give, give, and we go quick, then we've got it. We've got the ideas. We've got the capacity. It's just whether we're willing to give up the hero moment of, oh, my gosh, you know, AIM gets all the awards. We don't want awards. We just want to see this thing changed and make sure that we actually have a life on Earth. and the final final reflection for me is that that our role isn't you know so our indigenous systems don't look at the tree as the hero it's not about us being less than it's all about balance and just being in relation and again that is just like simple it's really really simple it the, these are like basic basic principles which we've just lost our way on as we just out rule our relationship with nature so seven million species 20 billion billion other animals on the rock it's just a simple time for us to start shifting our attention 
and understand that the prize is intelligence. We get a heck of a lot smarter. That's the prize. The prize is intelligence, which you see from mycelium, et cetera, and all these other patterns. So that is um that is what we see as as the potential. And yeah, it's a really we feel like it's a very big moment for for people to to play for the biggest possible prize. And so in that dreaming space, um, we've got to make it real. We can't just be in the dream space. We've got to be engineers, we've got to be designers, we've got to be architects, and we've got to be real good. Um, if we don't have a system view and we don't go collectively together then there's machines, um, real machines and, and humans leading some machines that would maybe prefer it not to, to be as effective as what we might like. Thank you, Jack. And uh, while you were speaking about this image of how we restore our relationship, uh, one of the images that came to me is actually the, the symbiosis of mushrooms and uh, trees. In the forest that actually makes a forest so trees alone don't make it mycelium alone doesn't make it we need diversity of species interconnected and actually making isolated organisms into a unified super organism and and that relationship is there it's very material and and uh, i agree with you that we are part of it and we just kind of forgot uh, and begin to separate ourselves from from it in many regards and uh, thank you for bringing up the fact that this mycelium is kind of uh, maybe this even mycories, the combination of different uh, kinds of um, organisms interconnecting with each other is already happening. And um, I would like to bring into this conversation uh, a holder of another organism that you know you just mentioned, Francois, uh, holds the space of uh, emergence uh, that's what i would call the Le learning planet institute as i think it's many regards as space of emergence in paris and i think while you're based in paris your the influence of your work certainly extends uh, absolutely globally and um, uh, learning planet institute has become a, a, a mover a catalyzer of so many important movements right now around the world or supporter of these movements Francois, how do you feel uh, this this moment of uh, us collectively discovering uh, the new dream and maybe the new ways of collaborating with each other? Well, first, uh, thanks for inviting me and congratulations for you know setting the scene. Uh, I think it's it's an important um, endeavor, and I congratulate uh, all of you that have participated in in making this happen. Um, so I, I feel privileged to be invited. Um, I don't know that I have something you know magical to say, um, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm certainly glad to listen and 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 to be part of the conversation uh, with the trees and and with other living being. You know, being an evolutionary biologist, you know, I, I've resonated deeply uh, during the meditation with you know our huge family tree uh, that uh, connect all of us. And, uh, you know, one text I, I wrote one day was uh, to a cousin. Uh, and I was asking, you know, how the cousin was feeling in these crazy times um, and, uh, and how it was the family part, uh, the air part of the family. Um, and, and this was a letter to someone I've never met. Uh, it's some, it's, you know, it could be, you know, any one of us, because we're all part of this big family, but it could be, you know, a tree or a rabbit or, or a whale uh, or a plankton. And, um, and because we are all part of this big family and we are all interconnected and we are all interdependent. And, and, and I think that the more we become aware of this uh, deep connections and deep interdependence, the more likely we are to uh, enable the emergence of higher level of, uh, Consciousness, including, you know, the fact that, you know, there is a, a saying from Confucius that say that we have two lives and your second life starts when you know you have only one life. And I think that to some extent what we are entering the era of the second planet, which is very much like Confucian life, the consciousness of the fact we have only one planet. So when you know that we have only one planet, then you have a second look at our planet and at our history, or past, present, and future. And I think that's an important moment. Uh, and, and so we're we basically trying to, to change perspective on what we do. And um, thanks to Jack, uh, I was uh, 
I received this amazing gift. I don't know if you can see clearly this uh, little friend. Um, and, and Galactic is, is an amazing uh, friend that was uh, modeled by Jack's team um, after, you know, the little prince and, and uh, Lettre Persane uh, for those that know Montesquieu's uh, writing in the 18th century. Uh, and basically, you know, this guy coming from another planet has seen uh, many uh, different perspectives. Uh, he's seen many planets, some of which are thriving, some of which have collapsed. And he come to us to, uh, because we are at this tipping point. Uh, and he's trying to help us to know which part of the tipping side we want to, to flip. And, and help us, you know, maybe imagine... Um, different paths forward because you know there is so many planets out there there must be some that you know have made the wise choice um how did they do it you know can we learn from them as well um and there is only one thing that travels faster than light and that's imagination okay so you know thanks to imagination you can you know go across the galaxy and then uh, uh see how it's going there and and come back maybe with new ideas and um and then you can start uh, imagining alternatives um, and you can start you know, sharing new stories. And, and this ability to, for instance, have fun about ourselves and about you know, what we're doing to ourselves and to our planet. You, know, you need this sort of changing uh, perspective. Uh, there is a, a very nice uh, uh, humorist on, on the web that basically invented a, a galactic committee coming to uh, study how civilized we were to before it, we would be accepted into the the galactic uh, civilized planetary uh, union, and you know you can imagine that you know we are not doing that well uh, about you know wh what it is that we could be changing. Um, you know, it, it, this reminded me of I think it was uh, a quote of of Gandhi um, that may or may not be uh, exact. But I think it's interesting. He was asked, what do you think of the Western civilization? And his answer was, it would be such a good idea. Um, and, and, you know, that's the sort of, uh, so we need indeed uh, a, a, a form of civilization that would be a good idea. And, and that's something like this that I think we can uh, maybe come up with. Um, and, you know, maybe Galactic will help us. Maybe, you know, kids will help us. Maybe, uh, you know, our own imaginations and dreams will help us. And uh, and can we change uh, the perspective? And um, for those of you that may wonder why my name is attached to uh, planetism um, on this screen, um, I don't know exactly where the planetism ID come from, but I do know that uh, it's going beyond citizenship because uh, citizenship uh, is born from city walls. And the city walls... Uh, were defended by men against other men, and they had the monopoly of citizenship. And so, as you know, ladies, you were not citizen uh, back then, and uh, even during the Enlightenment, and you know, it took hundreds of years before you know uh, you could uh, get the right to vote. But you know, migrants are no citizen nowhere, and children are no citizen. Um, and and so, you know, how do we? You know, and our friends, the trees and, and the mycelia and, and others are even less uh, of citizens. So planetism is a much more inclusive concept because if you're born on this planet, uh, then you're welcome. And actually, if you were born in another planet and visiting, uh, you will also be welcome because, you know, it's a very uh, open concept. Uh, and so, you know, that's why galactic is welcome. And that's why, you know, uh, many more uh, ideas are welcome uh, in that perspective. But this idea of planetism is also much more ecological by design because um, planetism is, is uh, englobing everyone on this planet, whereas the citizenship was, you know, defining the inside and the outside of the city walls. Uh, and so nature was outside and therefore not included uh, in that perspective. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, how do we redefine this? How do we build the first planets and institutions? Uh, and so the first one we are trying to co-design with many people, some of them are present today and, and many uh, younger ones that are not here today are also uh, involved. Uh, and the idea is to co-design a planet and university, a university where uh, we can learn to care for self, others and the planet, we can learn to uh, protect the commons that we have, the natural commons, 
the intellectual commons and the digital commons. And, and this university is a place where you could be uh, rewarded and recognized for your contribution to the global commons uh, while being able to learn from those commons and grow from those commons and contribute to uh, to grow those commons. And, and so that's, uh, you know, something that we are working with, with UNESCO, with United Nations University, and with many partners, institutions uh, across the world. Uh, but we want to co-design it with you. We want it to be inclusive, to all open to all planets. And we want uh, to be a place where we can learn to care for those planets, for, for those planetary uh, commons. And we want uh, it to be powered by the latest technology and uh, powered by, you know, the greatest uh, imaginations that such as the dreams and the dreamers that are present in this uh, call. So, um, you know, happy to uh, discuss this further in, uh, you know, if you want to uh, do come and visit us in Paris. Some of you have already uh, been here. Others are will be certainly welcome anytime that, that you're around. Uh, do come and, and uh, let's, um, let's see how we can build this dream together and, and be a little like, um, John Lennon, so that you know, we may be dreamers, but we are not the only ones. So we want to join forces, and uh, we are, you know, trying, for instance, to build a GPS for dreams, uh, so that you know, dreamers can identify each other and and start meeting uh, with one another and 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 start making their dreams come true uh, a little faster. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francois. <laughs> What a dream. <laughs> and actually, this idea of a GPS for dreams and something that I also hold um, as perhaps a challenge for us, we can explore a little bit later in this panel, is um, um, the controversy between dreams. The fact that uh, some dreams can be inclusive and some are not. And what really... Um, I am personally struggling with right now is um, a number of military conflicts, some of which are really uh, threatening our collective futures. Just uh, seeing how a situation was unfolding first in, um, in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, how situation is unfolding, unfolding right now in the conflict between Israel and Palestine, um, and the possibility that these uh, conflicts could, could spiral out into um, uh, a massive, uh, truly international conflict involving weapons of mass destruction. Why this is happening? I, I believe partially because uh, each of these um, conflicting parties hold a dream that is exclusive, in a way built up on this citizenship or even more uh, ancient divisional, let's say, uh, approaches rather than an inclusive dream that you, Francois, are offering, uh, the dream of uh, planetisms. Um, so I'd like us to explore how can we actually move from those dreams where, where parts of, um, of human family are excluding each other, try to do it very intentionally and very aggressively and using the most modern technology. How can we move away from that into something much more collaborative, supportive, um, and harmonious. And uh, um, maybe uh, to recognize that we have uh, voices uh, from different parts of the world, um, I would like to bring in Anna Lucia uh, and your work um, that you are doing in, um, um, in another continent, in, uh, across Latin America and South America and Central America uh, connecting to farmers, uh, uh, the communities uh, in their effort to um, to heal, heal the land, heal ecosystems. Um, uh, can you share maybe a little bit about your work and also uh, when you encounter these people, a lot of them are not, let's say, they are not intellectuals, they are not scientists. There are people living on the land. They are farmers. Um, they are uh, they are people that maybe are taking care of a forest or whatever. Like they, but they're let's say people that would be called simple pe people in intellectual circles. 
Uh, at the same time, they probably have a deeper understanding of what the, the land actually needs and and uh, and how we should more adequately live in harmony with it. So what, what's your learning in your journeys? Hello? I don't think we can hear you. Uh huh. I think what what is going on that you are currently uh, also in the status of interpreter for Spanish because thank you for stepping in to support this forum as a, as a Spanish speaker, <laughs> helping our Spanish colleagues to understand Spanish speaking colleagues to understand. Mm, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Wonderful. Yeah, I'll, I'll rejoin as an interpreter later. Mm. Um, well, thank you. Thanks, Pavel, and, and thanks to all who have already spoken. Um, I, I actually, in, in the work that we do here in, in Latin America, um, one of the things that have been like a pattern that I encounter with my work because I always ask farmers and, and like farmers organizations or local communities or forest communities about their dreams for the future. That's part of the process that we always um, work with. And it some, it sometimes takes a little bit of time and encouragement for people to actually even step into the question because one of the things that you said earlier regarding equity and regarding the way in which um, conflicting dreams have been trying to occupy like the collective narrative and discourse and even practices and policies around the world. One of the consequences of this is that some people feel discouraged to dream their dreams because they think that they have no way of making them a reality, which is a very sad thing for me. And it's a very, um, intense process for us whenever we encounter this uh you know because people even face we we face a little bit of resistance when we ask the question what are your dreams for the future and and some phases of disappointment or skepticism arise um in in some of the farmers that we've worked with uh when they are when they start thinking about all of the things that have stopped them from manifesting their dreams um which include, for example, these powerful stakeholders or narratives that are embedded in the way that they live their life, even in relationship to their own land. So that's one thing that in this part of, of the world we encounter, you know, like uh, that's one part. But also we find that in, especially for example, in populations that have been extremely affected by violent conflicts, like in the case of Colombia, which is one of the oldest armed conflicts in the world. Like we've been at war with each other for more than 50 years now. Um, when the Colombian government was signing the peace agreement with the FARC guerrillas here, um, they asked the Colombian population if they agreed with the agreements made, you know, in, in representation of them. Uh, and wherever the conflict has been the most violent and cruel and just crude, everybody said, yes, we do believe in peace. We do dream that peace is possible and we do want it. So, so what I'm seeing in my work is like this tension between these very powerful narratives that, that are like threatening people's ability to, to dream in terms of actually enabling them to just flow, like Alexander said at the beginning of the session, right? Um, or to tell their story or to, you know, continue their song, as Jack was saying. Um, but at the same time, there's this huge kind of resistance from within, you know, especially for people who, who are um, facing enormous hardship in life. And connection to that kind of the spirit of and, and the aliveness of wanting to be in this earth in a peaceful way, in a way that carries well-being, you know. Um, and like this resistance is something very powerful for me because in in from my point of view, considering these circumstances, 
what I think now is that our ability to dream, the ambitious dreams for the earth, is also a form of resistance against a lot of dominant, like hegemonic structures of thought, of ways of being, of ways of doing. Um, that you know, in 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 the middle of all of these crises, in which we are constantly being told that the world is ending, there's nothing we can do. Seven billion people. What is one person going to do? You know, all of these ideas, um, and more even more so for for rural people you know in in our territories in latin america um dreaming is a form of resisting so it's also a political stance that you take facing life in these times of our global civilization um i wouldn't i wouldn't dare to say or or to speak in terms of like a species level issue because I think that humans as a species are very, very, very diverse. And it's more like Western and Westernized societies have developed this form of relating to the land and to each other that has made a, that has had like several side effects and unintended consequences um, as part of our evolution. But I have also encountered people who are thinking about the future um, in terms of the past. So, and, and this is something that I would like to close with. There is a um, an indigenous peoples in, in South Western Colombia, uh, in the Andes called the Misak. And Misak people um, believe that uh, time is related to space and integrated in their land. And so when they are walking through the mountains, they tell you that the past is the path that is in, actually in front of you because it's the path that your ancestors have already traced for you and it's something that you can already see and the future is like the next generations that you can't see and the future is actually in the back so it's like the a complete inversion of the way we think in linear times about in, in linear terms about time in western civilizations in which we think the future is ahead of us um and so that we can predict it and we can control it or whatever. Um, but for them, since it's connected to their land, uh, it's actually the other way around, right? So it, so the past is what's already there and it's what you have to take care of too because it's what has been given to you by your ancestors. It's the path that has already been walked by generations before you. And you need to make sure that the same path that you're walking on is given to future generations as well, that you won't see because they're, you know, you're kind of walking in front of them and they are coming after you um, in your same steps, right? So this is also to say that dreams are, yes, related and connected to our ability to, to manifest the future, but also they are connected to our ability to connect to the past and to honor what has been given to us so that we can pay it forward and care for people who are coming after us that we won't be able to see, but we know that we'll be walking in the same path that has been laid out for us before. Thank you. And um, I think this there there is this powerful recognition in your... Um, um, in your sharing right now of uh, the fact that the uh, capacity of so many people uh, to dream is traumatized. And uh, in the chat, there was uh, some discussion, some conversation about uh, trauma, the trauma of separation, uh, the trauma that actually um, also breaks our relations and uh, how we carry this intergenerational traumas. You mentioned uh, Colombia and uh, 50, cent 50 years of um, active, uh, let, let's say very violent uh, uh, life. Um, and um, visiting Colombia, I heard stories basically from everyone. Everyone had uh, some experience in their family that is direct, kind of direct impact of that violence whether somebody lost a relative or was affected by the violence themselves. And it's hard to imagine in peaceful places how um, that kind of violence can really um, 
break um, break trust and break uh, aspiration. But just maybe to compare, there was a very recent research about the influence of uh, um, the Spanish Inquisition on uh, economic development of uh, of Spain. I actually can trace um, uh, so the difference the difference in in the level of development. Uh, between different regions of, of uh, Spain that are otherwise very, very similar to each other, actually has direct uh, um, uh, uh, correlation to the level of severity of repressions of Inquisition 400 years ago. So um, these intergenerational traumas block trust and block this ability to collaborate and and uh, co-create with each other for not just a few generations, but centuries. So uh, I think part of our conversation needs to be about that healing that needs to happen. And um, I would like to weave in one more um, panelist into our conversation right now, uh, Kriton. Um, um, I, I really admire your work. You operate in uh, one of the spaces that can be seen, let's say the politics in general is considered by people to be an extremely cynical space uh, where, where most people probably are, um, let's say they're driven by, 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 by their desire to get more power, more influence, build up their own, let's say armies, alliances, hierarchies, and uh, a lot of people in that space obviously just take agenda that is more relevant to their um, uh, their voters or or their allies. Um, but you, I think, are are are, are um, carrying a very different kind of message, uh, and you've been uh, uh, the voice of uh, environmental. Um, protection and, and um, uh, uh, working with uh, many, let's say, influ influential people to really bring that agenda forward. Despite, let's say, I can imagine how many hardships you had to endure throughout years of your uh, work. Um, what, what actually drives your dream and how, where do you find inspiration and how do you overcome, let's say, uh, the trauma that is evidently present in that space? Uh, personally and also collectively with your colleagues, with your partners, friends, uh, how do you move in that space and, and what's your dream about that? Well, it, when the dream is authentic, uh, you don't need much, you just go. Um, so, but uh, like like uh, many of, of people that want to change the world, uh, they often see that whatever we do and whatever change happens, it has to be ratified by a political institution in the end, in order that uh, this change, uh, you know, takes uh, flesh and, and body. Um, so that was uh, that is the motive for a person to get finally to decide to get into politics because somehow it's ine ine inevitable. You will have to pass from that, that procedure. So somebody has to do it. And the more there, there is, uh, the better. I want to, uh, to elaborate on some parts of the discussion. There's a lot of frustration around the world right now that things are going things are going really bad that there is a hopelessness that uh, uh, it's it's step takes us backward and not forward so it is very important now for people to, that have a dream to keep on working on this dream in respective and independently of what's happening around them. We are talking about interconnection, but it's a place, it's a time that we're living in times where um, 
things because of uh, of climate collapse, of the ecological collapse, and of uh, the unwillingness, the collective unwillingness of mankind right now to uh, to make the changes, to go beyond this uh, in an organized way, uh, beyond these issues. Um, things seem to really backlash, and there is a lot of fear, a lot of terror, a lot of uh, threats to everyday life and life of people we love. But I've seen in my work movements fighting against huge vested interests that have uh, the judiciary, the political uh, framework with them, and the movements have nothing. And in the end, they win. In this seemingly darker uh, frameworks, I haven't seen any movement of people, I'm talking about local local people who are fighting for the forest, for the water, for the air they breathe, for the schools, you name it. I haven't seen a single movement following its dream and not achieving things. So I think we have to keep that in mind. And the second, from my experience, um, there is a lot of segregation and polarization. And it looks like we are going to stronger polarization, segregation in society. And so it is important to, to dream because whatever we have, uh, all the institutions we have right now, they are not functioning. Uh, anymore, as Pavel said, the dreams uh, have, uh, we need new dreams, to say the least. Uh, so it's important to dream. But unless we manage to express these dreams in a language which is inclusive for everyone in the society, that is easily understandable, and that meets the common dream, we will not make it. Unless, if I will say differently, if we fail to find this language to express the dream so that it's, it's understandable, it's in its human heart, then we most probably are doing something wrong. We are missing big parts of the story. So this is from my, my experience that you can be perfect, uh, the more well-intentioned, the more uh, having the best dream for humanity, how you can communicate this and inspire all people to share it, is what will uh, will judge if the dream is served and becomes a human dream, or it stays for few know knowing and uh, wise people. Um, so, I think that's that's the main pieces of of, uh, of wisdom that my life and uh, dream seeking has uh, given me so far. Thank you. Thank you. No. Such an important message, Criton. Uh, and I, I I'm really want to, like, this is where my own heart goes, to be honest. I'm, I'm actually experiencing uh, right now, in the, not in this panel, in this panel I feel blessed, but more broadly, in this moment in history, I, I, I feel a lot of collective pain going through my heart. Uh, because of uh, my own history, I had to leave Russia as being co completely against uh, the war with, um, uh, with Ukraine and uh, 
feeling uh, that this war is a betrayal of something very, very deep. Um, not only within me, I'm a part, part, part of my family comes from Ukraine uh, and from the region where which is affected by war, uh, but also from in, in the sense of um, that collective unity because 20% uh, of Russians uh, share uh, share their families with Ukrainians and uh, this it's a very interconnected uh, population and uh, many of my friends who were against that war uh, left the Russia uh, left Russia and moved to Israel and took over the Israeli uh, uh, citizenship just to to, uh, to avoid killing uh, other human beings and uh, a year and a half later, they find themselves in a in a very brutal situation, um, which is also very scary, of course, for for um, yeah, for for the world. Um, uh, so, um, being in the space of dreamers and also sensing, I I, I know that all of you. Um, um, uh, people that are uh, in the room and, and and those of you who are speaking today in this panel um, connect to this kind of stories deeply. Um, so if we dream this together, what is our collective dream and what is our way to make, uh, like Kriton, you said, uh, these dreams accessible, these dreams heard? Uh, what, for instance, could we do in the next few months to to really help the situation move away from where where it is to to begin that healing if if that is possible at all which which i think is is a there is a huge problem in in even getting into that zone because the these wars continue the violence is is present it's not it's there at the moment but the, i i don't have an answer but it is this is where honestly my my heart goes with this conversation not to pretend that you know we are dreaming while you know things are going on we are if we dream with earth for the earth we need to look into this kind of dark questions and acknowledge that they are part of our reality so whoever sense you you might want to explore maybe um i just welcome you to raise your hand jack yeah i just think it's the uh, it's then into the design so you Let's let's build it and and let's let's work on the practical fusions that are needed to go diagonal in our cross hatching, which often can go very horizontal. And then you engineer the partnerships, you engineer the work, you set the outcomes, and you find the pathway. And and I think when we when we stay in story and and we stay in the dream state, then we can we can feel a loss of hope. And then when we get into the action phase. We can feel an incredible loss of hope because of how, to, how almost impossible it can always seem. And it's what's next. Like it is always what's next. You are we are churning my totem is a platypus. Um and the platypus is a, a really crazy, um, crazy creature. But our job's to churn the water. And so we churn the water, we churn the water, churn the water, and then once we've churned the water, we leave and the water's healthy. And so there's times when we've got to churn and there's times when we, when we have to build and, and, and engineer the systems. And so practically, like, you know, we, we've been looking really deeply and just going, okay, well, how do we move the economic credits and behaviours around custodianship? I think that that is something that we can all have as a species. That is, how do we get ourselves back in our custodial patterns? And the first group of citizens, one of the first visas we're rolling out in imagination is a million custodianship presidents um, who are going to be re-establishing custodial economies. So that can be super micro economies from the farmers in Latin America. And then we have a thousand organisations that we've accredited as Joy Corps, which is an extension of what the B Corp models offer to the world, but fusing Indigenous knowledge systems through those patterns. And then making sure we're patterning into those major players and those major institutions. Okay, well, you have to have Indigenous knowledge systems at the front end and the back end. And starting to weave the the elements that were left out of the cities into our design system frameworks. And there are models for this. You know, that the beauty is we've, we've seen the parallel models of exclusion. And so we can see the gaps. And it's a lot of it is in design. The other part of it is is working out how we center in that design i think that our job in custodianship is translation so that from the design perspective is very different to what we've approached i think design problems before and even for me to offer that 
you so I'm trying to resist the you solve the problem as the frame it's just being able to understand how we can help be a translator of, of what's going on in this pain of all these other species and the final part to remove I think to remove from conflict we had a very very tough day in our country um a few days ago where we had a referendum about whether Indigenous people would really just be given the most basic recognition in the constitution, like crazy, like the most simple, just that we've existed before the British came out here. And the majority of um, majority of people in the country said no. And it was sort of this classic disinformation moment. And the, the I hate to be reductive in, in, in the analysis, but sometimes there is actually some pretty like, consistent solutions. For 20 years, we've seen with Facebook, one of the most destructive pulling apart of our ability to hold the discourse together. And particularly in the last five years, it's just accelerated. It's got lots of little pockets of strength, but a referendum wins. <laughs> the winner from the referendum is Zuckerberg, who just gets to dial up the ad money. And, and I'm not playing conspiracy theory mode, just like looking practically at these platforms that are not they're not built for peace. They're built to extract time from us and then to extract attention from us. So that how we gather and how we gather in spaces in the internet is one of our most controllable prizes. That one is, is the engineering and the internet can happen very, very quickly like we're doing now. It can be very, very fast. It can be very, very free internet um, connection pending as well. So I think the, the network shifts that is that has to be a key part of the next 20 years which is why i mean i, I love what francois and the gang are looking at with planetary universities and and we have this ability in in this network playground of the internet to i think deliver what a lot was promised early on if we center nature through there i think we can rebirth you know some of what was looked at in in sort of the early web3 stuff and there is a pathway there's pathways to sort of find accelerated case study movements which then i think for Creton and the different players in the political systems, we can have these case studies to go, all right, well, here are practical case studies that have been hatched across five or six different nations. And we prove it in all these different areas with randomized controls trials and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we apply, we apply, we apply, and we keep looking at the tiny, 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 even if the thread is tiny, we look at that tiny thread of hope and possibility because it's tomorrow if, if, we, if we are just so unbelievably disgustingly focused on it. And that is the toughest part, I think, that um, the noise that comes to us is just that it's all over. And if it's all over, like, we've got two choices. We're going to close the laptops and that's it. Like, let's give up. But I've um, got no interest in doing that. So I think we've got, to, we've got to find that little portal and obsess on it. And when we obsess on it and, and visualise it and visualise it, we'll find it. Um, and we don't need billions to do that. Like, it's hundreds, if not thousands, of very, very focused people um, that can pull the weight of millions. Like we, we can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. And also um, we discussed uh, about this failed referendum with Alexander just shortly before, uh, before the beginning of the forum. And uh, we were discussing that what, what a lost opportunity to collective uh, human flourishing that that is there but um it, it, i think the message you're carrying there that that we really find these tiniest threads of hope and and amplify that despite and and that, that i what i also hear from Cretan that 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 the idea of working um in the space of some people what some people call radical hope hope no matter what Oh, Francois, how do you feel about this kind of question? Uh, I, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's vital that we dream to imagine better futures because, you know, the dominant uh, default mode of the future is, uh, is uh, making us sick. I mean, you know, it making the planet sick, and and uh, so you know, we have to heal our own dreams uh, and and make sure that we can avoid the worst nightmares, and that seems to be part of the 
the default uh, trajectory. Um, and that requires uh, the ability to uh, be the, the butterflies of the butterfly effect. Um, and and uh, you know maybe so far we are just the caterpillars, but if we become the butterflies and we flap our wings in the right place, then maybe we can you know in this chaotic world uh, lead to the transformation that that we aim for. And it seems like you know it's very unlikely that any one of us will you know flap the right wings in the right place. But historically, that's that's what has happened. You know, all of the human progress were you know uh, done thanks to you know a few butterflies that knew to unite forces and and to make a difference. Um, and and so you know how do we do this uh, is uh, is not that easy. But we have a mixture of of science, technology, dream, imagination, art, culture, uh, ethics, and philosophy, and relation to nature and inspiration from nature. That you know, uh, if we were able to mobilize that collective intelligence from human, from nature, from machines, uh, and if we were able to do this ethically, then I think we have a chance. And and I think it's uh, it's certainly worth trying. Uh, and and uh, and I think it's certainly worth inviting the next generation into the conversation. And I think that's why I think you know a university is probably the best place. Uh, because there is, you know, even uh, hard scientific um, data that says that young people are so much more creative than we are. Okay, uh, the peaks of creativity are at age five and and at during teens. Uh, so you know, I you know there is lots of creative people in the room, but we are likely to even all of those uh, were probably more creative when we were younger. Okay, so uh, you know, so some of us are better at connecting to our younger selves. Which is what Nietzsche uh, was uh, advocating for, uh, but uh, I think that um, you know there is uh, lots of use around us. You know, maybe uh, next uh, year, uh, Pavel, if you do this again, you know, make sure that you have young people around, okay, uh, and and that they they will inspire us uh, and and they will lead. So if we we are able to just connect to them and and um, and give them a chance, I think we'll have uh, even more impact. So uh, I know Tammy is running out and I don't want to be too long, but I want to thank you for, for this uh, amazing opportunity of, you know, dreaming together. I know, you know, uh, it's just a beginning and that's probably the, the best part of the conversation uh, is to know that there will be a, a follow-up. And uh, so thanks a lot uh, to all of you and, and uh, you know, looking forward to seeing you in Paris or during the Learning Pet Festival or anywhere on, on this planet or another one, you know, <laughs> take care. Thank you, Francois. And um, indeed, we are um, almost wrapping up, um, but I, I'd really like to hear from Critan and uh, Nadusia your uh, your response to this this question, and uh, and perhaps the, there is there was also a beautiful suggestion um, for in the chat to maybe at the very end before transiting to our uh, next speaker who is already here uh, i would like us to maybe dedicate a few seconds to really kind of send our inspiration and so our hope to places that are now in pain but we'll do that in a few moments Anna Lucia would like to share your your experience or your hope for um, dealing with these challenges? Um, yeah, I, I, I grow hope through working with other people and creating things together, you know, and doing things together um, because it really connects me with the human capacity to, to grow, to nurture, um, especially in the field that I work in, it, which is related to non-human systems in a very interdependent way, you know, with forest communities or with farmer organizations. And one, one way of growing hope for me is working with them and remembering that even though there are stories that tell us that we are an invasive species on earth, destroying everything or, you know, um, that we are disconnected from everything that's not human. We are also nurturers and life givers and life tenders on this earth. 
not only for for other beings, you know, like plants or animals or microorganisms even, but also for ourselves. So I think that's something that gives me a lot of hope is, is com coming in contact with this truth about us. And this is something that I do think can be spoken of in, in species terms, you know, like this is something that's cross-cultural uh, throughout the planet in which humans are present. Like we can be both things. Um, and so what gives me hope is remembering this fact, you know, and seeing the many different ways in which it manifests, um, even in, through social movements or through community forests that are collectively cared for and nurtured. Um, and working in kind of growing and, and strengthening those ways of being is also something that's hopeful for me. Like what brings me hope is this constant drive to make the dream a, a dream a reality you know like what can we do now to actualize the present into the future um and in the end i think that that's what's most important for me also like you know connecting to people in many different ways and and exploring what makes us who we are uh, as a species but also as people and as communities um and remembering that there are there are many things that we can do in our everyday lives that can bring forth this dream and allowing ourselves to open space for it and be dreamed by the earth as well thank you um we are really approaching the end of our session, Krit, and I, I feel a uh, desire to give you uh, still the opportunity to speak. Uh, um, um, uh, our next speaker, Erwin Lasley, is already here. So maybe you can share maybe a message of hope, because I sense it's really important. You brought this uh, energy into the space, and uh, maybe you can tell us what, what, what is the hope for you? Uh... Okay, uh, I will go directly to the beginning. Uh, hope for me is to, to put life first uh, and to, in the sense that this unity with the tree that uh, we felt in the dreaming space. Uh, so hope is uh, that we are united uh, with life. We understand that the interconnectedness and that uh, uh, we don't accept anyone and anything, even us ourselves, putting anything uh, above life. Thank you. And uh, as Francois said, we are only at the beginning of our collective dialogue but the dialogue that continues and will continue in many places including this one for the next three days and maybe the last um, the last thing i would like us to do is let's connect to that hope that is within us and within other people present in this room and let's um let's send our collective energy to places that now need it most where healing is needed where peace is needed and um Jack, thank you for reminding us that we should hold to these tiniest threads of hope. And also thank you to our friends from Australia who connected at this very, very late hour. Thank you for making it here and being with us today. Um, I know it's very late for you, but thank you for being here and bringing your energy and messages here. Thank you for having us, gang. And yeah, it's been, been a joy to, to hang out with you all. And um, yeah, at the, at the end of the three days, I think um, we'll be at a very old mountain in four days' time, one of the oldest festivals in, in human history called Banya Mountain, where we've gathered for thousands of years for joy. Um, so we're heading up there, and that's where we're going to press click on a switch to open this new digital country for the world. So we see that as a home, a network of networks, and a lab for humanity over the next 10 years. So anyone that wants to play there, um, wants to bring that practical hope and bring your projects and wants a, a safe home and a safe place that's got no borders and a place for, for all of us to come together. You're all welcome. We're gonna to try and just bring together the greatest 
group of misfits we've ever had come together and, and get to work. So, yeah, it, this is this is what we're going to do. We're going to keep cross hatching and cross hatching quickly. So it's been yeah, a pleasure to hang out with you all. And I'm going to go back to sleep and then wake up and go and hang out with some amazing people in the morning and, and bring some hope into their lives and, and thank them as well. So thank you all. Thank you.